The gentleman that's going to come up next, uh, you know him well. We all know him. He's the face of the baptismal waters, literally, if there was a face, in the sense that he's probably baptized more people than any other human in America uh, over the last three years, uh, probably close to 15,000 individuals that he has baptized himself with our teams. And as he said earlier today, I've known him um, for almost three decades now. Got born again in uh, a Baptist church, came to the altar, and within days opened up his living room to allow us to witness to his very dear friend, Matt, and he got born again. From the very beginning, you've been a man after God's own heart, and you are a reacher, a teacher, a lover of people, always sees the best, always encouraging. I watched him be in the water for 10 to 12 hours, and on the 180th candidate, he's as fresh mentally, as in tune spiritually as you possibly could be, uh, as if he was with the very first one. You're the only one that matters when you're in the water. Who can testify to that that has been with him? Yes. Married to his precious wife, Paula Jo, and uh, she's dynamite, and it's my privilege, my privilege to welcome to this platform our executive pastor of, the, of Christ Fellowship Church and um, uh, the baptizer, <laughs> Marty Yokohan, the baptizer. Welcome, Pastor Marty. Would you let him know you love him? Obey the Holy Ghost. My goodness, <laughs> he gives you words like that to build you up and to promote you in such a beautiful way, but what he did was set me up right after Pastor Jeff Lyle. I don't know what I did. I did something wrong. <laughs> He's like, who would I put in there? Yeah, bring Marty up. No, I'm just kidding. I'm kidding. It is an honor. You can be seated. You can be seated. We're just going to talk for this, this part of it. I did youth ministry for two decades. I, I, I loved those 18 years of being in the trenches with youth pastors and youth leaders. Is there any youth pastors or leaders in the room? Yeah. Would you stand, all the youth pastors and youth leaders, would you stand? I wanna, I wanna honor you. I wanna celebrate you. A lot of times we'll talk about the children's ministry because it's, it's so cute and cuddly and fuzzy and, and then we'll bypass that generation and go straight into young adults and young married couples. But that, that is a, that's a demographic. We have to do a much better job of, of ushering in the revival, not only for our children. The children get it. It's this young middle school and high school demographic that the world and the school systems are telling them and, and, and or causing them to question their identity, their purpose, and, and this is the very pivotal. You know, Billy Graham used to say back in the day, if you, if you don't reach them before the age of 21, chances are you're not gonna reach them. Do you know that age has dropped to 13? That at 13, they've already got their morals, their standards, their core beliefs already instilled and they're set for life at 13. That's why when we get in the water, many times now you'll see these, these, these prayer requests, hear these prayer requests of, I need, I need the Lord to help me with my, my anxiety, my PTSD, my stress level. And I'm like, how old are you, eight? Eight. At eight. Eight, nine, and ten years old, I'd finished preaching one of the North Georgia Revival evenings and was getting ready to leave the platform to go change and get ready to go into the water. And as I walked off, um, somebody from the worship team, one of the members said, hey, hey, Marty, I think, I think that young girl's asking for you. And I said, well, I'm sure somebody else can pray for her. I mean, I'm getting ready to go get in the water, do something important. You know, I gotta... And they're like, no, I think she's looking for you. And I turned and looked at this little blonde-headed girl standing right here. She was 10 years old, tears streaming down her face. And I said, that is not the most important thing right now. That is the most important thing right now. And so I stopped and came down and I said, sweetheart, how can I pray for you? And she just began to weep and kind of travail almost. And she said, my uncle molested me. And I hate him. The 
Jesus doesn't. And I don't want to. She said, I hate him, but Jesus doesn't, and I don't want to. She was 10. Not only in this pool, but when we get to travel and, and speak and minister in waters, there's some things I've heard that I will never unhear. There's some things I've seen I can never unsee again. There, there will be things I will take to my grave that no one will ever hear of the whispers in that pool and other pools. And Pastor Todd's the same way. We have, we have stories of desperation with physical needs, but many times what is more tragic and horrific is the things that have happened to young men and young women. Brutal things. Things you would never have dreamed of. Things you... Things movies won't even put out there because it's too graphic and horrific and, and I've heard those things. But it is an absolute honor to serve on staff with uh, a team who absolutely love Jesus with all their heart as, as we, we all do, but they love the people just as much. That's a big difference. When you said, I'd heard it years ago in Bible college in 98 when, when the teacher of that time, he said, Marty, ministry will always be perfect for you until the people factor comes in. <laughs> when you said ministry is great until we deal with people, but that's what we're called to. We're called to the mess. We, we pray that the Lord would deliver us from the darkness, and he said, why? I called you to it. But I absolutely love serving in those waters, serving this team after 18 years of youth ministry and um, traveling and speaking to youth and, and, and doing that was wonderful. It was wonderful. But when we got the, the um, call or the um, ask to step out and transition from youth ministry into the executive role, I really didn't know how to serve as an executive. I'd, I'd done youth ministry in and loved it for 18 years. We, 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 we built great teams of students and leaders. That's what we did well. We knew it like the back of our hand. We knew how to engage with students and have them engage with the Father. We didn't do, we didn't do uh, the video games and the, and the things like that. We didn't. Maybe you do, and that's fine. Uh, but we didn't do that. We, we for 18 years, were, were bent on taking students to the feet of the cross and then taking them to an upper room and then taking them to the streets. We didn't just stop at the cross. We didn't stop at the upper room. The upper room does you no good to get filled and speak in tongues and sit there. <laughs> he, said, he, he said, there's one reason I'm gonna fill you with power. To be a witness. Not a watcher. Nobody in this group, but I've been around people in other groups, not this conference, but in other conferences, you can tell the people that just conference hop. Not this, not this conference. But they're looking for that next fix. They're looking for that next shot in the arm that this is gonna be it. It's not a shot in the arm. It's a shot in the dark, the dark place, the, the closet, the, the finding his feet. Hmm. That's where it's at. So we're just gonna talk. I don't have a sermon. I don't have a sermon slide. I did youth ministry. All I know is slipping slides. <laughs> not <laughs> sermon slide. You ever felt like you were alone doing, doing what you do? Pastoring a church, leading a Bible college, a ministry training center, um, youth ministry. You ever felt like you're all alone? The three of you that felt like you were alone at points in, in your walk with the Lord and ministry time, I want to talk to you today. <laughs> the others... <laughs> I think we've all had moments where we felt all alone, like Elijah. I, Lord, I'm the only one left. I'm the only one left. 850 false prophets. I'm the only one left. And the Lord looks at him and says something so profound, and I, I don't know if you ever saw this, but the Lord looks at him and he says, basically, hush your mouth. I have 7,000 other prophets in Israel waiting, training, 
you're not the only one. Suck it up. Get back out there. What are you doing? My God, last night with Kevin Wallace, I don't know. I don't know. I don't know. When he talked about 18 pages of notes, I looked at my wife. She's like, how many pages of notes you got for tomorrow's leadership? I was like, Because I'm a college dropout. I, I dropped out of college back in 19-something when uh, they told me I was, <laughs> they told me I was going to have to take a speech class, and I majored in intramural sports. We won every flag football championship, every basketball championship, didn't go to school, didn't, didn't study a bit, and finally, the advisor called me in, and she said, <laughs> sweetie, <laughs> We're going to go ahead and enroll you for the speech class. I said, the devil is a lie. I didn't, I didn't do public, I didn't do, I didn't do oral reports in middle school. I, I, I would, I would lay out and play hooky. Anybody know what hooky, you old enough to know what hooky is? I would skip school, skip class when they told me I have to do that oral report thing. I didn't do that. I was not about to humiliate myself in front of my friends because I'm, I was terrible. At, at doing those things. And then I'm sitting in a, on a college campus and she said, hey, we need, to, we need to go ahead and enroll you in this speech class. You're going to have to. I said, no, that is not going to happen. And she said, well, you have to have this to graduate. I said, have what? She said, the speech class. You have to have gone through that speech class and earned the credit for that to graduate. I said, I didn't, I didn't, I didn't speak in middle school, in high school. I am surely not going to pay you my hard-earned money to embarrass myself on your college campus so I quit. I walked out that day. I never went back. I don't encourage that or endorse that. I'm just telling you what happened in my life. I was a heathen. You're not. You went to, I get it. You got eight degrees and all that. I, don't, I didn't. I did not. I said, I will not. I don't speak in front of anybody. And then the Lord says, and 93, hey, how about, how about, here's Jesus, here's Marty, you're broke, busted, and disgusted. And I gave my life to Jesus at Chestnut Mountain Baptist Church, 1993. I thank God for the word. I thank God, just Pastor Jeff, you hit it right on. Thank God for the Baptist teaching us how to get in the word and to disciple and win our friends. We need a spirit of Andrew to hit the house. We need a spirit of Andrew that Andrew says, wait a minute, Jesus, hold on. I got five more friends and brothers. I got to go. They need this. I, I didn't really need it that bad, but they do. They need it, Jesus. I got to go get some more. We need a spirit of Andrew. We need pastors. Your role of soul winning, it didn't stop when you got a pulpit. The streets still need you. Listen, if this were a hospital, if this, look, we're just talking. I don't have a sermon slide. I don't have, we're just talking. If this were a hospital, Bishop Lance would be the ambulance driver. He's going out there and get the broke, the busted, the rejected, the left on the side of the road in a ditch. That's Bishop Lance is coming after you. Pastor Robbie, he's going to be there when you get to the hospital. He's going to check your pulse. He's going he's to know if you're born again. If you ain't born again, he's going to make sure you're born again. Are you filled with the Spirit? If not, he's, gonna make, he's the one checking you in. Then you got to go sit down with Pastor Karen and Pastor Jeff. They're going to tell you everything that's about to happen. They're going to lay it all out. You're going to fully understand what's about to happen to your rear end on that operating table. You can communicate what happened to you out post-surgery. You can communicate it better than the doctor can. They're going to make sure you understand. This is what happened to me, and this is what they did. They cut me right here. They went up through the ventricle blood. They're going to tell you. They're going to teach you something. That's not, that's not me. I know my role. In this whole thing, I know my role. I fought for years to try to fill somebody else's role. I tried sitting in seats that were not meant for my rear end. I was on the right bus. I just hop in seats trying to figure out where it is, where it is, trying to get warm. I'm sitting in somebody else's warm seat. You know what I'm talking about? When somebody, you can tell when somebody left your spot, the moment you sit down, ooh, that's warm. That wasn't meant for your rear end. It was meant for somebody else's. Get up. Get where you're supposed to be. I know it. 
I know exactly where I'm supposed to be. I, I am telling you the truth. I kicked and clawed and screamed and fought when Pastor Todd came to my office that day. Can I show you? I mean, it's hard. It's hard to heart. This is real. Y'all want real? Y'all want to fake something? Whip something? This is just real transparent. This is who we are. This is who we are. Pastor Todd came and, 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 and revival had broke out. He came to me as youth pastor. He said, Pastor Marty, I need to ask you something. I said, okay, ask away, sir. He said, I need you to step out of the youth ministry and be the executive pastor. I said, no. <laughs> Get thee behind me, Satan. I don't hear, what are you talking about? No. Youth ministry is my groove. It's my wheelhouse. I know exactly. I mean, I can tell you when we go to fall retreat, we're brrr, when we leave fall retreat, all these kids are going to be slain in the spirit. The, the whole altar is going to be full. Leaders going to be full out in the Holy Ghost. We're going to be weeping, crying. We come back home. We change the world. Woo! When it comes to executive office, I have no idea what to do. And it freaks me out. No. I love you. No. He came to me a second time. A couple of months later, Pastor Marty. <laughs> you know how he does. <laughs> Thank you. Y'all <Thank you. laughs> know it's the truth. <laughs> I need to ask you a question. I said, no, I don't know where your keys are. He said, not that. Have you seen my wallet? No, he didn't ask that. He said, um, I need to ask you again. I need you to consider. Will you come out of the youth ministry? I said, no. <laughs> Ain't no way I would ever step out of that youth ministry. The Lord's back there. I'm not sure he's with all these adults you got running around here. <laughs> all the youth pastors and youth leaders said, amen, right there. I know what happens back there. They make out in front of you. They make out with somebody else's spouse out there. They'll at least do it in front of you. They'll talk about you to your face. They'll talk about you behind your back. Pastor, I love you. I'm with you till the end. Ain't nobody going to be here as long as me. I'm here. And next week, you got mad because Pastor moved your cup that's been sitting out in the foyer. Mark. So, the, so, the, so the third time he came to me, it's three times. <laughs> it's not that I was disobedient much. I was, I was not trying to be disobedient. I was trying to beg him, no. Youth versus executive. I don't know what executives do. What do they execute? I'm not a murderer. <laughs> no, I am a murderer. I would have killed some of them people in the church. All them foolish emails. Pastor, some of us need to be delivered a Monday morning Google. Checking your email. Yahoo. Some of y'all need to skip looking at emails until like Thursday afternoon. How can you get into a pulpit and be fired up and ready to go and preach the paint off the walls on Sunday and Monday? I quit. I can't do this anymore because Sister Betty said I'm a loser. <laughs> because I didn't have a reserved spot out front for her because she's been here for 37 years and she gives more money in the whole congregation. She gives more than anybody. And so how dare I not bend over and cater for precious... <laughs> I always have my notes like 18 pages and I can't even get to them. But the third time he came to me, he propped up against the door frame, put his head back, took a deep breath, did his lips. Y'all know what I'm talking about? You know what I'm talking about? The lip. You know what I'm talking about? Been around him more than a minute, you'll know he's. 
He propped up on that old door frame, put his head back. Sweat started pouring out of my forehead. I knew it. You know when somebody's looking at you? You, you can feel it. They're looking. They're way over here. You didn't even look that way, but you feel they're looking at you. That's the way I felt. I was like, oh, Lord, he's about to tell me. He's about to drop a major bomb. I'm talking about bomb. He said, PM, I'm not going to ask you anymore. I was like, thank you. I thought I'm going to fall like the rest of y'all. Everything was spiritual until Marty got up there. And he gets up there. He's like, what happened? We lost control of everything. He said, uh, he said I'm not going to ask you. I'm, I'm, I'm telling you. We have to transition from youth ministry to executive role. And walks away. <laughs> That's it? No plan, no strategy, just... You're it, tag, like freeze tag, and your kids. <laughs> You're it. <laughs> Come back, can we talk? Can we have a conversation? Been with you for 28 years. Can we have one conversation like, what do I do now? <laughs> Just walked away. But what they have always, they, what Pastor Todd and Pastor Karen have always seen in me that I could not see in myself. What I thought was a demotion. I, I considered it a demotion. To go from youth to exec, executive. Pastor, are you kidding me? But boy, you just grow as you go. It didn't take long for my heart to start turning and the Lord saying, this is that for you. I could not imagine being anywhere else, doing anything else other than executing. <laughs> Helping teams execute. Helping people like execute, putting batons in people's hands and saying, run with it. Giving people ownership. When the Lord spoke to Moses, he said, Moses, what's in your hand? He said, mm, my staff. He said, throw it down. Some of you need to throw your staff down. Not in a way that you're stepping on them, but throw them down to let them do what they're supposed to do. Quit micromanaging. Trust them. Let them have it. They can't run with your dream because you're squelching it every time you. <laughs> you're like, I didn't pay for this. I didn't, I didn't pay for this. But it's the truth. You'd be blown away what you could do when you give people ownership. I have watched these two. And the reason I keep talking about these two, that's my spiritual mom and dad. And, um, and for 28 years, we have served in some capacity, shape, or form. It started off with, um, I didn't have a microphone. My, my first wand in my hand was a toilet brush. That's the truth. Ripping up carpet, painting walls, cleaning commodes. And to think 28 years later, we still get to do that. We still get to do that. So I said all that to say, I'm grateful for the two leaders of this house and this, this great move that, that see in all of us what we cannot see in ourselves. In Luke chapter five, there's a story of Jesus walking out and seeing some men who are frustrated ready to quit. And he walks up to him and he says, I'm gonna need 
one of those boats. And he stepped into the boat of a young man by the name of, I thought you guys would know. Um, <laughs> Caneo Ministry Training Center registrations just opened back up for, <laughs> which, which boat did he get in? Simon Peter's. He said, I'm gonna need your boat, Simon Peter. And he gets in Simon Peter's boat and he, 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 he goes out and he teaches. And in, in Luke 5, when, when Jesus walks up on the scene, these, these men who Peter let him borrow his boat, he goes back in Luke chapter 5 and asks to borrow one. But these men, these disciples, these fishermen, trained fishermen, in this passage in Luke 5, can I just read it to you? You don't have to turn there. Just trust me. It's in there. How long do I have? Is it till 6.30? <laughs> Luke 5. So it was, as the multitude pressed about him to hear the word, that he stood by the lake Genesaret, and he saw two boats standing by the lake, but the fishermen had gone out from them and were washing their nets. Then he got into one of the boats, which was... Simon, Simon Peter. And he asked him to put out a little from the land and he sat down and taught the multitudes from the boat. When he had stopped speaking, he said to Simon, launch out into the deep. What did he say? Launch out. Say it like Kevin Wallace. Launch out. Notice he didn't say launch out into the drip or the drop or the puddle. Some of us have settled for a drop and a drip and a puddle. And he's calling us deeper. He said, launch out into the deep and let down your nets, plural, nets for a catch. Let down your nets. After you launch out into the deep, launch out, get out there, launch something, start something, begin something new. Let the creative God in you create something through you. Launch out. Some of us are stuck on the same. We're just stuck on the same. Been doing the same thing every week, every month, every year. We're doing the same thing. Asking God to show up in stale. Lord, bless my stale. The Lord said, no, I, I want to do a new thing. Launch out. I know you fished all night. I get it. I understand. Launch out. Lord, I've already been out there. Wonderful. You going to just stop talking and start fishing or what? Launch out. He said, let down your nets, plural, let down your nets for a catch. But Simon answered and said to him, Master, we've told all night and caught nothing. I'm a, I'm a, I'm a professional preacher. Don't tell me, tell me what to preach. I'm a professional. I'm a professional fisherman. I've been fishing all night. I know how to catch fish. Don't tell me where to go to catch fish. I know where to go. Been there, done it. And Jesus is like, you're cute. Launch out. <laughs> some of us talk to Jesus. Some of us talk to the Father. Some of us talk, we, we, instead of yielding to the Spirit of God, we want to have a conversation with him. When he tells you to do something, let it be yes before he speaks it. <laughs> yeah. Launch out. Uh, well, I've been there. I've done it all night. Lord, I ain't called anything. Look, the, the nets are empty. Nevertheless, 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 may this be a nevertheless conference for you. Let this be a nevertheless. I know what I'm going back home to. I know what they're going to be expecting of me. I know the emails. I know the pushback. I know everything. Nevertheless. Nevertheless. But watch what happens. Even in his shift, he still fails to do something right. Watch this. Watch. Nevertheless, I will let down the net. God's thinking plural. Jesus was thinking plural. Nets. You're going to need nets. I'm, I'm not prophesying. I'm telling you. I know what's coming. Nets. You're going to need nets, Peter. And Peter is almost obedient. He did let down something, but he let down a net. So much that that net began to break. God can't send you this this. 
Some of us have been praying, oh God, I just want to pastor big church. I just want to pastor big church. But he can't trust you with the 40 you got. See, everybody wants, everybody wants the edited version of three years in, 23,000 people baptized. We want this. Tell us how to get that. Everywhere we travel and speak, tell us how we get that. Okay. All right. Let the net break a couple of times. Get a scissor lift in here and go up in the rafters and put buckets because the roof, we're so broke, the, the, the roof leaks water. And, and you should be preparing messages and loving on the sheep. You're in here with scissor lifts watching my pastors get up here in a scissor lift putting buckets up here so when Wednesday night comes around and you know it's coming a storm, people don't think it's the glory mist falling down. It's literally, I'm telling the truth. People are like, oh my God, you see the, is the water of heaven. No, it was rain. I'm telling you the truth. People are like, woo, the Lord. Woo-hoo. It was rain. Oh, man, the Lord just spoke to me. We should know the difference. But, 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 to, get, but to get to the nets part where it's overflowing and you got to call for your friends, you got to go through the broken seasons too. When you show up, you prepare the whole Wednesday night message. You got it. You got sermon slides. You got everything ready. You got everything ready. And then, and then, and then the 56 kids you thought were coming end up being seven. And you get let down, and Jesus is like, love the seven. Disciple the seven. Pour into the seven. That's, that's the mentality. That's the way I used to operate. Lord, if you can't send the 50, I don't know if I can do this. Lord, if I don't have a mega church, you know, I don't a mega youth group, I don't know, mega this, mega that. We have all this mega stuff, but we got mini work ethic. We got a million dollar dream for our church, but a minimum wage work ethic. He's not being nice. <laughs> He's being mean. No, I'm just saying, I'm just, listen, you came because you want growth. You came because you want to go deeper. The deeper the water, the darker it is. I can see three inches down at the shore. Put me out 100 yards. It's deep as dark. We're discovering dark is where he is. Dark is where he wants us. Dark is where he's sending us. He said, let there be light. Why? Because it was dark and empty and void. And he said, that's not me. I'm a creative king. I'm a, I rule this place. I need light to come in darkness. I don't, I don't necessarily have a slide, but I do have a, a title. Uh, if I were going to give you a title. He said, Master, I'm going to get to that title. He said, Master, we've told all night, caught nothing. Nevertheless, at your word, I will let down the net. Let down the net. When they had done this, they caught a great number of fish, and their net was breaking, so they signaled for their partners in the other boat to come and help them. And they came and filled both boats until they both began to sink. I preached one time on a Wednesday night in here, the Lord wants to baptize your boat. Because we'll give him, we'll give him our family and our kids and our home, but don't touch my bass boat. That's mine. Or don't touch my golf outing on Sunday afternoon that I've been doing for 16 years with the boys from the, you know, the boys I hang out with, play golf every Sunday afternoon, you know what I'm saying? We play golf every Sunday. Then you're gonna do this revival thing, you know, I'm sorry, I'm speaking Dawsonville. I got my golf out every 16 years. I've been doing this 16 years every Sunday. You want me to come in here and get in water with people I don't know and it's nasty? <laughs> Y'all weren't here three years ago. We used to baptize in like sewage. <laughs> that water after about an hour with, with fingernails and weaves and lipstick. And... 
product on everybody's hair. And y'all think we're kidding? We want revival. You better. You need to go back and hit rewind on this thing. You need to hit rewind three years and go back to where it was messy and dirty and holes in the roof. Couldn't afford a roof. Couldn't afford nothing. Broke, busted, and disgusted. That's where we were. I'm talking about walking in here on a, on a <laughs> Tuesday afternoon, walking in here, and Pastor Todd's like, all right, we're going to put a wall right there. We're going to put a wall. Am I lying? We're going to put a wall over there. We're going to put a wall right here. We're going to shrink the sanctuary. We're going to put sanctuary by 150 people. He didn't talk like that. I don't know why I keep going to I revert to Dawsonville. <laughs> keep reverting to Dawsonville. We were going to make the sanctuary just like this section. That's it. Because we couldn't fill it. And God never asked us to fill it. But we kept trying to fill it. And he said, I didn't ask you to fill it. I just want to fill you, then I can fill it. I just need you to throw the nets out and put your little stinking net mentality away. Wall here, wall here. We were all ready. We were all ready to just kick the can and move down the road. I was ready to go back digging ditches. I dug good ditches back in the day. I go dig it again. Because that old backhoe never talked back. I never got an email from Kubota <laughs> telling me how bad you didn't dig that trench, right? See how I messed up? You left that dirt, that clod right there. You see what you did? Never got an email from Kubota. Never. I could go back digging ditches and nobody would mess with me. I could do my thing and make good money digging ditches. Some of, y some of us are like, well, you know, if I had more money, I could do this and I could do that. If I had more money, our church, our ministry would explode. No, if your heart would explode for him, the more money would come. It's very simple. It really is. We make this thing difficult. He said, I will give you the vision and the provision. I'll do it all. Just step out. Throw your net. Launch out into the deep. Get out here where it's unknown and uncomfortable. That's where I am. I'm not in safe. Not in safe. Y'all took boats. I just started walking on the stuff. You want to walk on water? You can. Come with me. Mm, thank God for a vision right here on this platform. Thank God for a man who captured that vision. Didn't go sit on that vision. Shared that vision. Part of the creative process for you and anything you launch into, if I had a title, if I had a title, I would call this launches, Launching, launching it. Letdowns and leverage. Launch out into the deep. Start something new. Before you leave tomorrow afternoon, God is gonna put a deposit on the inside of you because that was not the only vision the Lord wanted to come from this house. And it's in seasons like this, in days like this, where you can grab hold of something that you haven't grabbed hold to in a long time and he can deposit something on the inside of you that without him, it would fail and flop in a moment. But with him. But with him. That's why it's so important to be in every session. That's why when the waters open up, I had somebody ask me, should I get in the water again tonight? I said, I am. I am. I'm going to get in there every week if they'll let me. Why? Because you couldn't talk me out of it. What he's doing in that pool, in that pool, and pools all over the nation and everywhere we travel, Seoul, Korea, what we're watching him do, it is so, it is so like God. Unscripted, unprecedented, you couldn't expect it. You couldn't have scripted, you could not have drawn this up. If he pulled 50 of the greatest Christian leaders in the world together and said, show me the next move of God. Nobody would have said baptismal waters. Nobody. Nobody. That's where God comes in and is like, drive by. Here 
there you are expecting everything. And the Lord comes by. He's like, just a random drive-by baptismal, bapt- I mean a revival that just broke out in baptismal waters. What in the world just happened? It was this drive-by. <laughs> he's gone. Launch out. When, when the Lord, when, when, when the Father created in Genesis, he, he, he said the, the waters are deep, the earth is, is void, it's empty, and, and, and he began to speak things and declare things. The reason some of your, your visions haven't come to pass is because it's still, you're still holding on to it. The moment you speak that thing, now you give life to that thing. When, when Jesus said, Lazarus, come forth, and everybody said he can't because he's dead, Jesus said, no, he's not dead, he's dormant. <laughs> he's just dormant. He's dormant. That thing that's on the inside of you, it's not dead, it's just dormant. Release that thing, add some water to it. Add some water to that dormant seed and watch what Jesus does. Some of us are too proud to get in the water. Oh, Lord, why me? Let somebody else say this stuff. Some of us are too proud. Too proud and too pretty. Well, I don't know what to do for my makeup. It would be terrible on my makeup. Listen, I've, I've told youth ministry, 18 years, I'll tell you. Listen, Jesus is not interested in hurting your feelings. That's not, he's not trying to hurt your feelings. He is not trying to hurt your pride. He's trying to destroy it. He's not trying to hurt your feelings. He's trying to crush your feelings so we can walk around like dead men and dead women. Dead men don't feel things. Dead men only look in one direction. Takes us a little while to get. <laughs> Had to give you the illustration. Launches, starting new things. Speak to that thing. Add structure to that thing. Build you a team around you. Launch out. Do something new. And then letdowns. Well, we could talk about letdowns for a long time. If you haven't had a letdown in ministry. Are you, are you in ministry? <laughs> you, <laughs> I know you call it a ministry, but uh, <laughs> if you've not been heartbroken and walked over and trampled on and lied to and lied about, and, and that's just from your church staff. I mean, <laughs> I'm just serious. Letdowns. You know, I remember, I think the first major letdown in, in the ministry I was called to was in youth ministry. Three years, I'd served three years in youth ministry. And what I was told was a successful youth ministry was 10% of the church congregation. The only problem with that is that success cannot be found in the scriptures. So whose success rate are you basing your success on? They, they all told me, all the great youth pastors and leaders, well, if your church and, and, and your church is running 100 people and you have 10 students in your youth ministry, then you're a healthy youth ministry. That's a lie. I'd go to these conferences, youth conferences and youth leaders conferences. First thing they want to ask, the moment you step foot on the campus, you can't get on the campus long enough. And they're like, hey, Pastor Marty, how many youth are you running? How many are you running? Y'all know y'all been there. How many are you running? How many are you running? Like the cattle. I'm not running anybody. What in the world is this? I'm not running anybody. I'm not running. How many are running? I don't know. I ain't, I'm no, I don't know. How many are we discipling? How many, how many kids are coming hungry and, 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 and at home they're getting hell on earth and mom and dad's busted up and, and I don't know why I keep talking about youth ministry. I guess because it's in the good. I don't know, but. Man, we're just loving students, man. We're just showing them Jesus and we're, we're modeling what a godly, healthy relationship 
should look like because they're not getting it at home. They're watching mama and daddy argue and then mama go cheat on him and he's cheating his taxes and stealing from everybody and running a shady business. But yet Sunday morning they sit side by side on the third row, hands lifted, and I'm confused and I don't understand your Christianity. That's messing me up. And you, pastor, if you want me to go after Jesus, if you want me to bleed for him, you better hemorrhage for him. So they're watching our marriage. They're watching everything we say and do. and Watching. I got four minutes. <laughs> Launching out. Letdowns. My God, I was a youth pastor. Been there three years. Thought we were doing okay. Taking kids all over the nation to conferences and they were getting wrecked. Baptizing my daughter got youngest daughter got baptized in the Holy Ghost at eight at a youth conference. She was eight, but she had to come with mom and dad. Couldn't afford a babysitter. Looks like a teenager to me. You coming to the youth conference? Standing about twelve rows back. Thirty two hundred students in this big packed auditorium going after Jesus. It was at Brownsville Assembly of God. Their, their youth conference that they had in the in the. Pensacola Civic Center, whatever it's called. Kids getting wrecked. A young daughter getting baptized in the Holy Ghost. I thought we were doing well with youth ministry until I came home and one of our youth leaders, he said, uh, I need to meet with you. I need to meet with you at six o'clock. Service starts at seven. He sat me down. He said, Pastor, I've made a mistake. I said, well, okay, well, we can get through anything, man. What's, what's going on? What are you dealing with? He goes, I'm not dealing with anything, but I'm about to go away for a long time. I said, well, you, you're moving? Pastors, don't get so disconnected that you get so naive to what the world is going through and dealing with. I was so naive. I'm like, what, you're moving? He's like, mm, -mm. No, uh, my, my stepdaughter turned me in and um, they're coming after me for three things, statutory rape, incest, and strong arm rape. Each of those carry 25-year sentence. They're gonna throw the book at me. That was in 2004. Now, he never went on a youth trip with, a youth trip with us. He never went on a, any kind. We, he never was with any student. He was there to oversee. He would help us take up, take up the offering. But he was still a youth leader. We were pouring into him. And that man got sentenced 50 years, no chance of parole. It was the first harshest sentence like that in the state of Georgia. And deserved it. I'm not, I'm not saying, oh, woe is up. He deserved that. You made that bed, you sleep in that bed. It's just where I'm at. You can, you can throw mercy his way. He needs it. He'll be 86 years old if he comes out. The first month he was there, they almost beat the life out of that boy. Put him in the, uh, in the hospital down there in South Georgia for about three weeks. About killed him. All because... He was lured, lured away. And so I, I, I immediately felt like I was a loser. I can't, I, can't, I can't do this. I'm a failure at raising youth leaders, and so I wanted to quit. I was going to quit. Took our kids to one more conference. I said, when I get back home, I will resign my position, and I will go back to digging ditches. I've said that probably five or six times in the 28 years of <laughs> being born again and and especially being in ministry, Pastor Todd has heard me multiple times say, I'm going to dig ditches. And every time he looks at me, he goes, we're going to be okay. <laughs> you need voices in your life like that that tell you, I know how you feel, but you're going to be okay. And that man had twice, my pastor, in a heated moment, I am sharing some of the most raw stuff. I'm just like, here it is. There's no S. <laughs> There's pain and cat marks and blood and scars. Twice, my pastor has said, sit your tail down and don't say another word. You're not moving. You're not quitting. We're gonna get through this. You need somebody in your life. You don't need a daddy that comes, oh, come here, baby, come here. Let me hold you. Let me love it. You. you need a daddy to say, oh, my God, get Come here. 
edit that because we can't do that now in the 21st century. We can't do that in 2021. We need to do that in 2020. We need some daddies and mamas that say, come here. Sit your tail down. Listen to me. My God, I got, I got no more time. Launches, letdowns, and leverage. There, there needs to be a time when you come. Y'all pastors, you understand this. You have people that come in on Sunday morning, get born again, and Sunday night wanting to serve in the water or wanting a prayer badge. Sit your tail down for 28 years. <laughs> That's what you want to say. Well, I just got saved this morning. I don't know why they won't use me on the worship team. That was three hours ago. Obviously, they haven't heard my voice and seen my gifting. Nobody cares. Sit down. Sit down. Yeah, good Lord. I gotta hurry, but do y'all know the Facebook messages? I'll get Facebook messages. Hey, hey, Brother Marty, I've got a word for the North Georgia Revival. The Lord has given me a word for the North Georgia Revival. My response, okay, awesome. When were you here last? I don't remember seeing you. When were you here last? Oh, I haven't been there yet. If you have a word for this house, there's a great chance that the Father is going to expose you and get the scent of this thing on you before you deliver what's in your hand, your, your mouth. You need to come and deliver something in your rear end and put a, put a mark on a seat for a few minutes and sit under this thing. I know what most of you are thinking. Is he on blood pressure medication? <laughs> Does he take anything? I'm like this 24-7. I am like, the, I am wound up tighter than a banjo string. I'm telling you. Get out of the water at 1.30, get in bed at 2.30, up at 6.30 saying, this is the day, this is the day that the Lord hath made, that the, I will rejoice, I will rejoice. It's supernatural. It's just supernatural. But, but, but you got to be willing to launch out, do new things, man. Launch out. Come out of that ministry. Maybe you've been doing it so long, you can do it blindfolded. That's good. Take the blindfold off. Do what God called you to do. I would have been stuck, and I love students if you're in this room, and I pastored you for 13 years, I, uh, uh, 18 years or however long I was here. What day is it? <laughs> what month is it? What are we doing here? What conference is this? 18 years of full-time youth ministry. 10, I guess, here. So youth, if I pastored you, I loved doing it. I really did. I loved it. I, it's wonderful. But I would have been, I would have been, I would have just been back there. Which would have been fine for me. But it's not about me. It's about what the Lord wants to do through us for everybody else. Launches and then letdowns. My God, if we've had letdowns, but you're still here. But the last part I want to talk about is that leverage, that leverage. They call for their partners. Pastors, we highly encourage you in the next day and a half. Keep your business card. Seriously. Well, maybe they'll call me and give me an opportunity. Or maybe they won't. Maybe they just need a friend to talk to. Maybe they're not looking for your opportunity. Maybe they're looking for your voice and encouragement and correction. We welcome the voice of inspiration and revelation and all that, but we don't welcome the voice of correction. I need the voice of correction in my life. I need that belt to come off, the belt of truth. When you want to quit and give up, and the pastor says, nope, this belt's about to tell you what the truth is. You're going, to stay, you're going to stay right here, rooted and grounded in the faith. We don't beat people around here much. I got to hurry, I got to hurry, I got to close with this. This is why we do what we do, honestly. 
through all the, the launches, they're beautiful. The letdowns when you want to quit. But when you leverage a church, a ministry with five, six other pastors and ministries and churches, when you begin to leverage that net mentality is broken and the net, everybody brings their nets, everybody brings their teams, everybody's partnering together, loving on each other. You couldn't tell if somebody was from Freedom Tabernacle or Relevate or Christ Fellowship or Church at White. You couldn't tell the difference. They all act the same, talk the same, walk the same, love the same, serve the same. Everybody's the same. But through all that, this is why we do what we do. This, is, this will always be. It's never about the 23,000. It's about the one. It's just about that one. Marriage is restored. That man came and said, my marriage is over. By himself, he said, my marriage is over. This was the month after he came and got baptized. This is the edited version. This is the, this is the ooh, celebration moment. But what you don't see is him weeping and wailing, saying, my, my, my divorce is right upon, it's on the threshold of my home. She's got a lawyer. I've got a lawyer. We've got the paperwork. All we got to do is sign it, and it is over. And I said, what's your name? Where are you from? Why are you in the water? Do you want to hold your nose? He said, I'm, I'm believing God for my marriage to be restored. The next month, he comes back, and I said, Zach, welcome back. He goes, and he reaches his hand up the steps and pulls her into the water. 